Hi, I'm Thomas Bowles, Prince William County Agricultural Extension Agent. Welcome to our video. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this week's class. This week is uh, troubleshooting problems in the vegetable garden. My name is Thomas Bowles. I'm the Ag Agent here in Prince William County. Just a quick review. When we're talking about troubleshooting any kind of, of plant problems, we want to think of IPM or integrated pest management. And so we want to think about using the using the method that will cause the least amount of potential harm we want to do that first and then gradually scale up if we need to um, and so the base of our ipm pyramid is cultural uh, any plants that are treated the way they should be are in the conditions that are ideal for them are going to be more resistant to any kind of pest than plants that aren't. And then above that, we have the physical mechanical things like pulling weeds, trapping insects, using barriers. Uh, above that, we have biological tools that we can use, although those are a little bit hard uh, sometimes to, to deal with. Uh, and then finally, we have uh, the conventional chemical issues or chemical pesticides uh, that can be used, but they are the most toxic and ideally those are the last resort. When we're using IPM to solve pest problems, we want to identify the pests or pest um, and see if control is warranted, determine what our pest control goals are, know what control tactics are available for those pests, and then evaluate the benefits and risk of each tactic. Um, and then choose effective strategies that are, as I said, going to cause the least amount of harm to people in the environment. So the basic or the most basic part of troubleshooting is to know your plants. Um, the more you know about your plants, the easier troubleshooting is. Uh, knowing what the usual suspects are, knowing what's normal for your plant's life cycle, uh, there are times when plants look really bad and that's because they're senescing, they're dying off. Um, and it's not really an issue of something wrong with the plant, it's just their natural life cycle. Uh, understanding what insects, good and bad, that frequent your plant are helpful. Knowing the diseases that your plant pr commonly gets is helpful. Um, and knowing the cultural conditions, as I said, to to make sure that your plants are growing in the most ideal conditions so that they can be the healthiest they can be. And again, that will ward off a lot of pest issues or uh, minimize the damage that those pests can do. And it, as you plan out your garden, um, it's important to think about what resistant varieties there are. Um, you know, there are some plants that have common issues all the time, like tomatoes, um, there are lots of different resistant varieties. Using that as opposed to an heirloom uh, might solve a lot of your pest problems. So it's something to think about as you're planning. So if we look at pests, let's start with insects. Um, some of them are important because of the damage that they do, and some are important because of the diseases that they can spread. Um, and so, for example, tomato hornworm does a lot of vegetative damage to a tomato. Squash bugs do an awful lot of um, disease vectoring. Um, they don't do that much damage to a squash plant or any cucurbit, but um, they vector a lot of disease. And often it's the disease that's going to kill uh, your cucurbit. So they're important because more important because of that than they are the damage that they do. Um, it's also important to know your beneficials and be able to identify them because you don't want to um, kill off your beneficials willy nilly. Uh, know what your pollinators are, know your predators. Parasitoids, it's a little bit harder to know those because for a lot of our parasitoids, they're really tiny and seeing them is difficult. Um, but having an idea that parasoids are out there. And I've got some re resources for you there on the right. Um, a really good one is the first one, the IPM poster of natural enemies. 
uh, that's done by uh, UC Davis and the NR group there. Um, Max Southern or Max Field Guides to uh, the Southeast Garden is available on Amazon. It has uh, lots of information on both good and bad bugs. And then uh, our friends at Rockingham County Extension have a nice publication on um, IPM and insects. So there are a variety of controls to use for insects. Um, the first one is creating a habitat for predators. Uh, depending on what the common problem is and what natural predators go after that common problem, depends really on, on how you create that habitat. Uh, one of the simplest ways is to mulch with straws, or excuse me, with straw. Um, having a layer of straw creates an environment that supports both black beetles and uh, spiders, and they can be very important predators, especially for um, immature pests. With some pests, we want to use exclusion to keep them out. If we keep them out away from our plants, then they're not going to be a problem. Uh, a good example of that is using row covers. Um, sometimes the easiest way to deal with insects is pick them off the plant and throw them in a jar of water with some dish soap uh, to drown them. Insecticides, though, are sometimes necessary. I know a lot of gardeners don't want to use insecticides. Um, you know, one of the big drawbacks is they tend to be broad spectrum and they'll kill good and bad bugs. Um, but there are cases where insecticides are necessary. It's important with insecticides to make sure you're using the correct insecticide that's going to kill the correct uh, pest. Um, and if you need information on that, uh, you can contact your local extension office and we'll be happy to help out with that. The other thing to, to be aware of in the vegetable garden particularly is that insecticides have withdrawal times. And what that means is uh, if, you imply, if you apply a pesticide of any kind, whether it's insecticide or, or um, a fungicide, um, there's a wait period between when you apply it and when it is then safe to harvest that particular vegetable. So that's something to be aware of. That will be on the label, so um, it's really important that you read the label and know what your withdrawal times are so you don't accidentally uh, ingest pesticides. Also, it's a good practice to make sure you're washing your vegetables before you use them, uh, which will help with any residual pesticide as well. So here are some examples of some things we can do. Um, here we've got a layer of straw, and again, this creates a it looks dry on the top, but underneath you've got a humid, moist uh, layer where you've got spiders and black beetles. Um, they are predators for a variety of things, including young slugs. Um, so for a lot of plants, this is, this is a good option. Now, it's important to understand your plant because this is not a good option for some plants. Plants that are prone to stem borers this is a bad idea because stem borers uh, like this environment as well. And so having a layer of straw on a plant that typically has problems with, with uh, stem borers, you're actually encouraging those stem borers rather than uh, discouraging pests using this particular option. So here's a floating row cover. And floating row cover is simply a row cover cloth. Um, it's tacked down so it won't blow away. The idea here is that any insects that are going to fly in and lay their eggs uh, aren't going to be able to do that because they can't get to the plant. Now, in the background, you see these metal hoops. Um, they are there so you can create a low tunnel. A low tunnel is simply... Um, a floating row cover that's actually attached to metal hoops gives you a little more space um, for plants that are going to grow a little higher or some of the plants are going to grow at different rates. Uh, 
a a uh, low tunnel is a better option than a fro floating row cover. Floating row cover is good if everything's growing about the same pace, um, so you don't end up with gaps. And of course, this is our bad bug swimming pool. Uh, it's water with a little bit of dish soap, and you can see Japanese beetles picked off and uh, left to drown. When we talk about insecticides, there are a number of different types of insecticides, so it's important to know what type of insecticide you're using, um, and they affect insects in different ways. Uh, some of them they have to ingest. Some of them are contact, which means they have to touch the actual pesticide. Uh, fumigates, we don't, in a vegetable garden, we don't really use a whole lot. Um, fumigates, though, um, get in through the spiracles, and they get in, it's basically them inhaling the pesticide. Again, pesticides are our uh, last line of defense, really, when it comes to certain insects. And as I say, sometimes they are necessary, uh, but in the vegetable garden especially, we try and avoid using pesticides whenever possible. So here we have uh, one of our not so not so desirable um, pests is a tomato hornworm, and you'll find them on a variety of different plants. Um, there are actually a variety of different hornworms. Um, most of the time, though, in the vegetable garden, we're looking at tomato hornworms. These are relative, if you can, if you spot them, they're easy to deal with because you can pick them off really easily. Um, one of the interesting things about hornworms is that they uh, reflect in black light. Um, so if you have a black light flashlight and you go out in uh, twilight, you can pick these up. Um, a lot of times that's easier to see than some, especially the smaller hornworms. Um, there are a number of predators to the tomato hornworm. Uh, the most common is the tachnic wasp, which will lay its eggs, and then you'll I'll show you a picture of, of what it looks like when it's been infested with tactic wasps in a little bit. Next, we talk about diseases. Um, with diseases, with disease, we, we talk about the, the disease triangle. And what that means is in order for there to be a disease, you need three elements. In the right environment, the right host plant, and the right pathogen. If you have all three, given enough time, you're going to get disease. If you have only two, you're not. Um, and so we'll, we'll talk about a little bit of these, these different points of the triangle. So the host plant, there's not much you can do about that because, you know, <laughs> um, you're growing that plant. So the host plant's going to be there. So the way we mitigate disease through the host plant is that we choose resistant varieties. We use trap crops, which I'll explain in a moment. And we keep the right cultural conditions so that our plants are as healthy as possible so that they are more resistant to disease. On the pathogen side, um, they're ubiquitous in the environment and there's not a whole lot we can do about it. Uh, in some cases, we want to remove host weeds because some of them will um, provide shelter or they will provide um, a, a source of some of these diseases that can be spread. Um, and barriers, you know, with, with a floating row cover, or row covers in general, um, we can exclude some insects that vector disease. Um, we can use fungicides as a barrier. Fungicides as a preventative, um, well, A, you're putting down a lot of pesticide, and B, it's something you're going to have to do regularly. Um, and so for a lot of gardeners, they don't want to have to deal with that. And then our third point of the triangle, the environment, um, which goes to the, cult the cultural conditions that we're growing our plants in, um, making sure that there is enough water and not too much water. And sometimes the uh, 
sometimes Mother Nature is not so kind in determining how much water we have. Um, and in some cases, we can have way too much water, which will help foster disease. Um, plant nutrition is, imp is important. A, uh, a plant that has all the nutrition it needs and is healthy, again, is going to be more resistant to disease. And we want to make sure that there's proper airflow uh, in the plant and between plants, again, to, to facilitate the drying of the leaves and the reduction of uh, conditions that pathogens like. I want to talk a little bit about um, resistant plants. So most of our resistant plants are hybrids. And it's important to understand some distinctions between GMOs, GEOs, hybrids, and open pollinated plants. Now, an open pollinated plant breed ba breeds back true and can be pollinated um, by any plant, or excuse me, any plant in that variety. Um, a hybrid plants are when we cross breed two open pollinated plants. Those two genetic lines result in a hybrid that has what's referred to as hybrid vigor in animals or uh, resistance to specific diseases if we get the right genetic lines crossed in plants. GEOs and GMOs, um, as a home gardener, you're not going to see, see these. Um, and people get worked up about GMOs. It's fine to get worked up about GMOs, but in the home garden, you're not the the seed is just not available for you, so you don't really have to worry about it. Um, the only difference between GEOs and GMOs is that well, GEOs, which is a term that's used in Europe a lot more than it is in the U.S., um, you're mixing traits at the cellular or genetic level using genes from within that plant's genome, um, and then GMOs you're bringing genetics from outside that species. That's the only difference. But uh, in the home garden, open, open pollinated plants and hybrids are the two that you're going to run into. Hybrids typically have more resistance to disease. Some heirloom varieties that, are, um, that have been bred in specific localities do have some resistance to disease, um, but that's usually a very localized thing. Um, so generally our open pollinated and hybrid our heirloom plants are typically more susceptible to disease, but they can be effectively grown as long as the cultural conditions are uh, ideal and as long as we're, we're doing our best to break up that disease triangle. So in a uh, catalog, you might see the tomato variety. Um, F1 just refers to the fact that it's a hybrid. Um, and then you have all of these abbreviations after it. And that, uh, in this case, we're talking about a uh, tomato. And these are resistant codes. And so this particular variety is uh, resistant to uh, fusarium wilt, races one and two. It's resistant to Brazilian wilt, and it's resistant to um, tomato mosaic virus. And so if you have issues with any of those three um, diseases, this would be a good option for you. And your seed catalogs and your seed packets are going to have these abbreviations on them. Um, seed packets that don't always say what they are, but most uh, most seed catalogs are going to give you a table like this on the left that gives you an idea of what those abbreviations mean. And again, many insects are vectors for disease, um, aphids, leaf hoppers, squash bugs, some flies, thrips, even some bees can be disease vectors. Um, and so we, again, we want to make sure that we are uh, active in our insect control as well as our disease control. Uh, the picture on the right just shows an example of thrifts um, acquiring a disease from a host plant, a host weed in this case, and transmitting it to um, a tomato. Uh, 
But as I said, there are lots of insects that, that will do this. Squash bugs, for me personally, have been the worst. Um, I've lost several um, pumpkin crops because of it. So I mentioned a trap crop earlier. And this is an example of using blue Hubbard squash as a trap crop. And what a trap crop is, it's basically, it's a crop where we want all of the insects to go. Typically, it's a crop in a, in a species that the insects prefer. And so in the case of squash, generally speaking, Blue Hubbard squash is preferred by, squa by squash bugs over, say, cucumbers or uh, pumpkins or something like that. The thing with the, with the trap crop is all of the bad insects are going to go there, and it makes it easier to do pest control because you're focusing your pest control on those trap crops. Those trap crops you may not get... Um, you may not get any vegetables from them. You might, you might not, but they're there um, to focus the bad insects in one place so it's easier to deal with them. When we talk about um, cultural uh, considerations, um, we want to make sure that we are growing things the best way we can. Uh, with to tomatoes, you saw the, the list of, I'll go back a minute. You saw this whole list of, of different things that tomatoes get. And <laughs> tomatoes are one of the most disease prone plants we have, um, yet everybody loves them and that's one of the reasons why we grow them. Um, and so some of the things we can do to uh, help our tomatoes to reduce some of the disease problems that they have because some of the diseases they get are soil borne. We can uh, prune off some of the lower leaves. We can prune off the suckers. Um, we can uh, mulch them with straw so that when water hits the straw, it doesn't hit the soil where some of the pathogens are. Um, we can water from the bottom of the plant to reduce the splashing. If we're watering from up high, the impact of the water droplets on the soil is going to be greater, and so you've got a greater splash up. We can also trellis our plants um, to keep good airflow, to keep the leaves dry. Uh, there are different ways that you can trellis your plant. Uh, here on the right and the top, uh, you've got an example of using an overhead wire. Um, there's on the bottom, you've got what's referred to sometimes as the Florida weave. Um, and you can see on the one on the bottom, especially, they've started to prune off the bottom leaves again to reduce that splashback uh, from rainfall and from watering. Lots of disease resources. Um, One's not necessarily better than the other, uh, but they're all a little different. Um, a couple to, to point out is, uh, again, re relying on our friends from UC Davis, uh, their IPM uh, website on diseases is really good. Um, and then Cornell has a Vegetable Doctor Online website, which is very good at uh, diagnosing things for you. And then we have environmental problems. Now, a lot of times environmental problems are blamed on diseases, and it's really not diseases. It's just something in the environment that's caused a problem. And these are some examples. Um, if you water too, too little, obviously that's a problem. If you water too much, if you don't water consistently, all of those can cause problems for your plant. Um, Sunburn and sun scald is another issue that you sometimes run into when fruiting vegetables. Uh, cold damage can be a problem. Uh, sometimes we get a little too eager in the spring and we transplant things into cold soil and that can cause stunting and sometimes uh, people associate that with uh, disease or nutrient, nutrient dis deficiencies. Sorry about that. Um, and then there are just general nutrient deficiencies that you run into. And so we have to think about 
is this really a disease problem or is this an environmental problem that we can deal with to make the plant healthier and to fix that damage. And so here are some uh, watering issues. The picture on the left, you might think, oh, those leaves are curling because it's not getting enough water, but that's actually a case of too much water and the leaves are curling. Um, another problem that we get with too much watering, if you look at the lower right, you can start to see disease forming. Um, we've got some root rots here on these lettuce plants caused by overwatering. And then with inconsistent watering, we can get blossom end rot. Now, blossom end rot can also be a, uh, a result of a calcium deficiency, but not always. A lot of times in gardens, we get our soil test and we see that we've got the right pH, got enough calcium, we still get blossom end rot. And that is a function of inconsistent watering. And so it's important that we try and water consistently. And what I mean by that is you don't want to give the plant too much water and then not enough water, not regular water. Um, sometimes too, to keep in mind is that with our fruiting vegetables, a lot of times once they set fruit, they're going to need a little bit more water than before they set fruit. These are examples of sunburn and sun scald. In the middle, we have sunburn. Uh, you see that with tomatoes quite a bit. Um, basically, these are, these are both the same issue. Um, sunburn is a little bit uh, less intense than sun scald. So uh, what happens is basically the fruit is exposed to the sun uh, and it gets just like we would get a sunburn, it gets sunburn. Um, and in severe cases, it's, it's called scald. And with tomatoes and peppers, a lot, of, a lot of times we get sunburn, but it's usually mild and doesn't really affect things. Um, when it gets serious, like the sun scald we see on these two peppers, it's obviously going to damage the fruit um, and make it unpalatable, uh, if not inedible. Um, and there are lots of reasons for this. Sometimes it's the way the blooms grow. Sometimes if we are pruning to open up the canopy to, to reduce uh, disease, sometimes we'll open you know, the fruit up to a little more sun than it's used to. And just like somebody who's spent the whole summer inside who suddenly goes to the beach without sunblock, they're going to get burned. Um, so it's just one of those things that uh, it's an environmental thing that we can we can control. If you're ending up doing pruning, where you're thinning out the, the, the plants to get better airflow, sometimes shade cloth uh, can be handy to reduce sun scald. This is an example of cold damage. Um, here we have in the lower left, we've got cold damage that's affecting the leaves. You know, some people will say, oh, that's disease um, and want to use a fungicide. Um, here on the right, we have examples of cold damage on squash plants. Um, this would be late fall and you can see malformed squash. You can see this sort of water, I don't know, water soggy type coloring to it. On this one, in you can actually see fungus starting to grow because it's gotten too wet um, and it's gotten some cold damage. Um, you can see like this is the normal color here in the lower part and the fruit itself is, you know, got that sort of waterlogged sort of color to it um, that indicates cold damage. And so this is an example or examples, I should say, of uh, plants that have been put in the ground when it's too cold. You can see how spindly and just awful the plant on the right is. That pepper plant is just doing horribly. Um, and it's going to take a long time for it to recover. Whereas if the person who planted that waited a couple of weeks, so the soil warmed up, planted that, it have a, a much healthier, much more vigorous plant.
Um, the picture on the left is a tomato that was planted, soil that was too cold. Um, it's a nice big transplant. Well, one of the issues that we run into when uh, plants are, are planted too earlier is that they have trouble taking up phosphorus. And you can see on the edges of these tomato leaves, they're kind of purplish, and that's one of the indications of a phosphorus deficiency. And so there may be plenty of phosphorus in that soil, but because it was planted in soil that was too cold, the plant can't take up that phosphorus, and so it's going to suffer from phosphorus deficiency. There are lots of nutrient disorders, and one of the best ways to prevent nutrient disorders is to get a soil test um, so you know what you have to deal with in the soil and know what to add to the soil so your plants get everything that they need. Um, this is just a handy sort of diametric chart that uh, shows you, depending on where and what you're seeing on the leaves, can give you an idea of what's going on in terms of uh, deficiency. And sometimes that deficiency, um, or sometimes that's an indication of deficiency, and then we see that last row, um, sometimes that can be an indication of toxicity. Typically in the vegetable garden, we're not seeing a lot of toxicity, especially if the pH is correct, um, but these deficiencies can happen. And so it's important to be able to recognize the symptoms and be able to deal with those. And again, having a soil test where you've already figured out what's in your soil and what you need to add uh, can help uh, head off these before they become a problem. So talk a little bit about some uh, of the vegetables that are commonly grown and some of the issues that we run into. Um, Again, with tomatoes, we want to make sure that they get into the ground when it's warm. Generally, in Northern Virginia, we're talking around Mother's Day. Um, they can be grown from seed outdoors, but it takes forever. Um, so typically, we start those indoors, we harden them off, and then we transplant them outside. Um, we want to plant tomatoes deep to encourage strong roots. The stronger the roots are, the more available water and nutrients are to the plant, and the healthier they are. Again, with uh, tomatoes, we're gonna trim off the bottom leaves. We're gonna mulch to reduce disease and to help control weeds and keep our soil temperature relatively constant and help with water retention. Even though we think of tomatoes as being part of the cuisine of a lot of places, where it's really hot, tomatoes don't like things really hot. Um, if it's over 90 degrees, tomatoes start to stress. If it's over 100 degrees, tomatoes really, really don't like it. Um, and so it's, it's one of those things to think about if they're in full sun and it's really, really hot, shading them might be helpful um, to limit the, the stress on them. And, it, and the heat stress and water stress, those two things contribute to um, really decreasing the flavor in tomatoes as well as delaying when they become ripe. So that's something to think about when you're growing tomatoes. Um, growth habits, you know, they can be bushy or viney or determinate or indeterminate. A lot of times we want to uh, trellis or cage them. We've talked about heirlooms versus hybrids, um, but here's something to keep in mind. The common pests that we have with tomatoes, there are lots and lots of diseases as we we're talking about, but typically when we're looking at insect pests, we're looking at hornworms, stink bugs, and Japanese beetles. Hornworms, for the most part, are going to attack the vegetation. Japanese beetles and stink bugs tend to attack the, uh, the actual fruit. Um, we don't necessarily need to worry about harvesting in this particular presentation, um, but some companion plants are a good idea because they have, sometimes they have chemicals that help ward off certain insects. Sometimes it's a function of providing a habitat for uh, those good bugs that we want. 
whether it's pollinators or predators. Um, so some good companions for tomatoes would be things like onions, asparagus, carrots, cucumbers, marigolds, uh, basil, parsley, and garlic. I will say something about marigold. Um, mar the, the insect repellent in marigolds is actually typically in the roots. And so a lot of times we get the, the greatest benefit from marigolds after them at the end of the season when the marigolds are, are past their prime and you um, and you cut them off and let the roots decay and that will give more insect repellent than when they're alive and kicking. Um, another member of the Solanaceous family are peppers. Planting methods are, are, are similar. Um, typically with peppers, we either stake or cage them instead of trellising them. Um, it helps them grow more upright. Uh, and again, that helps with disease uh, management. Typically, um, our hot peppers are a little more resistant to insects. Um, in Northern Virginia, hot peppers and banana peppers tend to grow better than sweet peppers, but all three of them can be grown in this area. Um, some of the common insect pests we run into are potato beetles, which don't really do a whole lot of damage, but they can if they're large infestations. Uh, flea beetles are another problem that we run into, um, and leaf hoppers. Uh, generally though, peppers don't have a lot of disease pressure, or excuse me, a lot of insect pressure. And then some good companions would be things like asparagus, basil, garlic, marigolds, and parsley. One other thing to keep in mind, um, if you look at the pictures here on the right, um, if you're not aware, there's only one ripe pepper here. Um, peppers that are green, are immature and while they are edible, uh, the flavor is, is much less than if you let it go and get its full color. Although sometimes the big one pest that's not mentioned here are slugs. Sometimes if you let the peppers go a little too far, especially if they're low hanging peppers, slugs can be a problem. Uh, so something to keep in mind. Uh, the cucurbit family are things like cucumbers, uh, pumpkins, uh, squashes. Um, they're another plant that usually we want to start them inside, although they can be started outside, direct sown. Um, we sometimes, uh, the spacing is important because especially with our squashes, they will grow out. Um, squashes and, and pumpkins require a lot of space. Cucumbers are much easily trellised, uh, although you can trellis squashes and pumpkins. Uh, if you look over here, the picture on the upper right, these are cucumbers and the other cucumbers because cucumbers don't have as much problem with vine borers than squashes and pumpkins. And so um, we've got straw on, to, uh, on here to create a a predator habitat. Um, if we did this with squashes or pumpkins, we'd be creating a vine borer habitat as well. Um, so we know that's cucumbers. The bottom picture is an example of a cu cucumber that's put on a trellis that's sort of a teepee shaped trellis. Again, trellises will help reduce disease. Sometimes they can make it a little difficult to, uh, to harvest in the sense that this tip, this teepee shape, sometimes you get fruit in the center and don't realize that it's there until it gets really large and kind of quirky and not very uh, palatable. There are some bush varieties that can be staked. Um, like I said, it's ideal if you trellis uh, cucumbers in particular. Um, Common pests on cucumbers are cucumber beetles and aphids. If you include squashes, um, squash bugs. Uh, companion plants for all members of this family would be things like beans, the cabbage family, corn, peas, radishes, sunflowers, nasturtium, 
and again, our friend marigolds. Sweet potato is another crop that's grown um, in some gardens. You know, sweet potatoes, for some people don't realize they can grow it in their garden. Sweet potato is a really nice plant because it's typically pest free. If you're looking for an easy garden plant to grow, sweet potatoes, generally speaking, are the plant to start with. Um, and typically we start with a tuber and we collect, uh, we collect the sprouts and we plant those. Um, they're the, what am I thinking of? The shoots that grow off the tubers are, we refer to those as slips. And typically we grow those slips or we plant those slips uh, when it gets warm here in this area, it's usually June um, because we want the soil really warm. Uh, sometimes we can speed that process up by putting black plastic down for a week or two before we want to plant to make sure the soil is good and warm. Um, we space them about three feet apart and we let them vine out. And so they are going to leaf out and vine like crazy. Um, and they do need a lot of room to grow. We don't want to trellis these because the nodes of these plants, as they grow, as the vine grows along at the nodes, they drop more roots. And where they grow those roots, they can form tubers. So everywhere that they drop roots and form more tubers increases our yield. So we don't want to trellis them because otherwise those nodes would be up in the air and wouldn't be able to produce tubers. Um, some common pests are wireworm and knotroot ne nematodes. Um, that said, at our teaching garden, we've been growing sweet potatoes for, oh, I don't know, probably 15 years, and we've yet to have a problem with either one. Um, the, the one pest problem that we do have with them, if we leave the sweet potatoes in the ground too long, sometimes slugs are, are an issue. Um, and unfortunately, if you get a really wet fall, uh, the environment that's created underneath the leaves creates a good environment for slugs and they will go into the soil and they will start eating the tubers. Um, but that can be mitigated uh, sometimes as well. Uh, and you can cut out those bad spots. Um, and again, you know, you don't want to leave them in the ground too long and you won't run into that issue. Harvesting is about three or four months down the road. Um, you know, the tops will begin to die back close to harvest time, but you definitely want to harvest before the first frost. Uh, after the first frost, it's way too late. Sometimes you'll get frost damage. A lot of times this is when slugs get, get really intense because they're down in the soil. Um, and companion plants for sweet potatoes would be things like peppers, sunflowers, and okra. Lettuce is another common grown plant. Um, you know, lettuce, sometimes we, we plant outside, but most of the time we're um, planting them indoors and then using starts. Whoops. Um, Spacing is important with lettuce. You want room to grow. You don't want the lettuce growing together. Otherwise, you run into some disease issues. Um, there are two types of lettuce, head lettuce and leaf lettuce. Uh, leaf lettuce is easier to grow in most cases. The other nice thing about leaf lettuce is you can cut some leaves and the plant's still there and it will produce more leaves and you can cut them repeatedly. Um, as they get heat stress, they're going to bolt. So that's something to keep in mind. You can extend the season by using shade cloth. Um, the two common pests that we run into with lettuce are slugs and aphids. Um, and they can be quite severe. Uh, at our teaching garden, most of the time we have problems with slugs, not aphids so much. And then companions for lettuce would be things like carrots, cucumbers, onions, radishes, strawberry, garlic, and chives. And you can see in this picture, you've got um, onions growing in between this lettuce. The crucifer family um, includes a lot of different plants. Um, 
And a lot of these plants are actually the same species, just different strains of them. Brussels sprouts and broccoli and cabbage, for example, are all the same species. They've just been hybridized or what's the word? They've been um, developed into what we would consider like breeds in a dog. Um, and so they have different characteristics. These are cool season crops that we generally start indoors and then we transplant outdoors. This is something you definitely want to use row covers for. And the reason for that is one of our biggest pests is cabbage moth. Um, and if we can keep the cabbage moth off of the crucifers, we don't run into that problem. Um, cabbage worms, as I say, is a common pest. Harlequin bugs can be a pest. Cutworms can be a pest. Uh, Cutworms um, are more if of you an enjoy issue, this I think, video, with the root. Please let us know with your questions, comments, and um, suggestions for other classes. Companions videos. would be things like beets. For more information on uh, lawns even and gardens, contact the Extension Horticulture like Help Desk at Master uh, Gardener Rutabagas. at PWC, family, um, but they do very well with GOB. crucifers, Thanks celery, we'll see you next corn, time. dill, nasturtiums, uh, onions, sage, and sunflowers are all um, other companions. Bunch more resources for you, and we'll send those out uh, with the uh, with the evaluation. And at that point, uh, I'm ready for questions. Do we have anything on the? Yeah, we have one question. Um, it's from Rick. And it's, uh, he has two raised beds, uh, several fabric 20 gallon containers with tomatoes and all have septoria. So I've been trimming away the diseased parts for weeks, bagging, but there's a fair amount of leaves that remain in the soil. Well, I need to throw out much of the soil from those four by four beds or some soil, or is there a treatment option? Um, yes. So it depends really on what you want to do. Um, Saporia is out in the environment and there, I would definitely clean up the leaves, but in terms of should you replace the soil, you can, it doesn't necessarily, you know, depending on, on what you're replacing it with, you may be bringing Saporia or some other disease in. Um, and so I wouldn't necessarily worry about it too much. I mean, you could remove the top layer and replace it with, uh, say, potting mix, which is sterile. Um, but I'm not sure I'd go through all that trouble. Uh, there are treatments, but it, we, they're really more um, available on a commercial scale. And the bad thing about them is they will kill everything in the soil. Um, they're typically fumigants. And basically, in, in agriculture, what happens is they put these huge tarps over the field. And then they um, slip in a hose. And they pump in a fumigant pesticide. And it goes down into the soil. And like I said, it kills pretty much everything in the soil. Um, and that would be ridiculously expensive to do on a home gardener uh, scale. Um, uh, one other thing you could do to sterilize the soil is you could bake it. I don't recommend doing that because it tends to stink. Um, and it, you know, if you, if you think about the volume of soil that you're talking about, it would take a very long time. But Rick brings up a good point. Uh, with tomatoes, you know, a lot of times they get disease, regardless of what we do. Um, and so the best tactic is to trim off the disease leaves and throw them in the garbage and just let the plant recover. And sometimes it's a matter of keeping the plant pruned and sometimes the plant will, will be fine after you've pruned it once or twice. Um, Disease plants in general, you want to throw away at the end of the season, bag them up, throw them in the trash. Uh, 
Um, and sometimes, especially with tomatoes, you know, it's one of those things where sometimes no matter what we do, the disease is so bad that the best thing to do is, you know, just rip them out and throw them away. Um, and I know a lot of gardeners that keep extra starts in pots so that if they run into a disease issue, they can yank that plant out and replace it. Other questions? I don't there are, there are no other um, questions in the chat box. Does anyone have a question before we go? I just wanted to add that putting potato, sweet potato slips in is very easy for anyone who hasn't done it since I did it at the Fauquier Education Farm. And uh, yeah, they're very, they don't have a lot of roots to them, but they do take root. So um, there's not a hard plant to plant, so. Thanks, Ross. Um, and the other thing about sweet potatoes is you typically get a pretty su substantial yield um, for the area that you're growing them in. Yeah. Yeah, they do grow a lot, so. Anyone else? Well, as you have questions about issues in your garden, uh, especially your vegetable garden, or actually any garden really, um, feel free to uh, contact us and we can help diagnose and help make recommendations. Um, use our email, mastergardener at pwcva.gov. Um, also, if you have questions or uh, comments, suggestions for other classes, please let us know. Um, we're happy to provide whatever education we can and um, help you with problems. Thank you all for coming. Um, next week, we're going to have a presentation from our intern, Max, on uh, cool season crops for the fall. So look forward to that. And then after that, I think on the 17th, I could be wrong on that date, but following Wednesday, um, we'll have a presentation on pollinators. Thank you all for coming, and we will see you next time.